Have you ever heard of something called slave play? Yes, I have. It's is in fact the play, which is at the Noel Coward Theatre yeah. in London, which is the West End, right in the middle of the West End. It's like not some subsidised thing. Um, and they hit the headlines last week because they were going to have two performances when they start in June, I think it is. Uh, and these performances were going to be effectively black only. Yes. Um, so this would be... Uh, by invitation, they're being very careful the way that they set this thing up because, of course, they would fall foul of the law. So they're sort of actually going to what they call black groups and activists or whatever, inviting them. And also the <coughs> reasons put forward for this is that they say that we need uh, an audience to feel that they are not being um, looked at with what they call the white gaze. Yes. That's <clears throat> G-A's. Z-E, right? Not the other one. Um, but basically, it is essentially this kind of concept, which is, you've had in the arts for a long time, there's something called the, the masculine gaze, you know. But anyway, that's the way they've got round it, Carl. So they couldn't say white people. So basically, they said the white gaze. And this is just extraordinary that they can even <coughs> come up with this. But at the same time, it's not, not extraordinary, extraordinary, entirely predictable. Yeah. I feel like, sorry to interrupt the video, but I just want to direct your attention to the aesthetics range of merch that we have on the store. These are beautiful images that I think work really well as posters or mugs. So if you want to support us, going over to the merch store at shop.lotusita.com is easily the best way other than signing up on the website. So I thought, um, I, I've never heard of this. So I looked it up on Wikipedia and Wikipedia tells us it's a three act play by Jeremy O'Harris about race, sex, power relations, trauma, and inter interracial relationships. And already from hearing that, I'm like, oh, God. Yeah, yeah. Not, of course it is. Not exactly a laugh right. Yes. <clears throat> yeah, exactly. Yeah, prepare for a good time, folks. Yes. Um, but, uh, but anyway, so it follows three interracial couples undergoing antebellum sexual performance therapy because the black partners no longer feel sexual attraction to their white partners. The title refers to both history of slavery in the United States and to sexual slavery role play. Right, so this is American fetishism. Mm. So it's not the first time, actually, God. There was a, a, a the Theatre Royal Stratford uh, East, which was, I think, last year or maybe the year before. Mm -hmm. But there was an attempt as well to have what they call them blackouts. So nights, which are, that's their name for it, blackout, uh, where they encourage a black only audience. Um, and I think that what's happened with these people is that they're rowing back on it a bit now because it caused such a storm and quite rightly because it's it's racist it's oh, yeah. pure racism it's, it's definitionally it must be racist yeah. yes exactly yeah. in fact uh even more uh, i'm trying to recall his words the actual playwright you mentioned there jeremy o'harris yeah sort of said that in fact actually uh we don't want you know the white gays but also because uh Black people need to feel secure with lots of other black people because black people and white people look at such things differently. Oh, do we? Right. Okay. So this is what he's. This is what he said. It, you know, do you need any more proof? This is just outright racism. Sure. Um, it's also very interesting how it rejects the founding premise of liberalism, which is just we're all the same. Mm. Uh, these people are saying, no, we're not all the same. Uh, we're not like you, and you mm. don't understand mm. us, and we don't want to be around you, actually. Mm. And so it kind of leads into further questions. Okay, well, then why did you come to England? Mm. Uh, there's a whole continent full of people who look like you. Uh, would you not be more comfortable there? Mm. Uh, does this have applications for other races of people? Yeah. Actually, you know, yeah. should the Chinese be allowed a Chinese one? Should Jewish people be allowed a Jewish only one? Should English people be allowed an English only one? Mm. And suddenly you get into quite murky and unexplored depths that the average Westminster liberal will say, oh God, this was just a bad idea. Yes. Well, <laughs> talking about liberals and, and, and white liberals, of course, the theatre is sort of their playground. Mm. They, uh, they won't probably see anything wrong with this. Oh, well, that's true. They probably won't see anything wrong with it. I don't see, I think it was discussed on the BBC, a, certain, a few news programmes, but on the whole, not very much. And it, it certainly wasn't on the BBC TV. Yeah, it didn't hit their radar, did it? But, but yes, it, not, not really. Because you see, in a way, they would pro probably understand because it all stems from the idea that only white people can be racist. Yeah. 
That's also, where it comes from. The, there's there's an inherent superiority in it. Right? Mm, That's mm. the issue. They're like, oh yes, no, you are right. The blacks they do feel uncomfortable around the whites. They do need their mm, own experience, mm, and mm. it's because I'm somehow um, emotionally more developed than you mm. that I don't need this. And actually, it'd be bad for us to have mm. it. But you definitely need that. There's a condescending, patriarchal sort of paternalism in that. Absolutely, there is. Also, can you imagine just on a on a day to day level? Mm. This guy, the playwright, saying this, what he's just, what I just quoted there. Mm. If you were a, a white playwright and you said, and you just simply took, took the words and just turned them around to talking about black well, people. Crime. Well, the fact is you'd never work again. Yeah. But you'd also get arrested. Oh, yes. <laughs> arrest. <laughs> never work again. There would be endless, endless discussions about what this says about our society. All of these things in, in all of the newspapers, there'd be silence from the Tories or from anyone who considers themselves oh, conservative. I, don't, I, don't, I think it'd be worse than silence. They'd come out and disavow. Oh, yeah. And they yeah. would say, no, of course that's wrong. Of yes. course, whatever the Labour Party says, we agree with 100%. That's what they'd do. It'd be better if they were silent. You see, the thing is, I mean, I don't know, do you go to the theatre much? Uh, not often. I've, uh, I've been occasionally. Uh, um, I used to go an awful lot because I used to review them for various newspapers and everything a long time ago. But um, don't go very much now. But uh, this is all of a piece really generally in the system. I mean, the most kind of provocative, the most edgy thing you could possibly do now would be put on a, a play which even just had a character that was in some ways uh, explaining the appeal of Trump. Yes. I yes. mean, something as mild as that. Yeah. But the idea that you will see a play or write, read a novel or go and see a piece of visual art, which in any way is critical of multiculturalism, or migration or any of these things, is inconceivable now. I mean, the inconceivable. And that's the only place you would find anything that pushed boundaries now. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, the thing about this is that actually this is all kind of a settled science when it comes to progressivism. This is all completely within the remit. No, no, no. It is the case mm. that the majority has been dominating the minority and therefore the minority need their own private spaces away from the majority. And so this all fits completely within the intellectual framework mm. of the modern left. Mm. Um, and so this is, in, this is the safest thing that they could do. Mm. It's not in any way. And that's why the media hasn't picked up on it. That's why it's been the alternative media who's been like, hang on, is this? Is this yes, exactly. Um, I think, you know, a lot of people would say, well, what does it matter? You know, it's a theatre. Haven't we got far more important things to talk about? And actually, I would say in an odd way, no, because they are the kind of, they are the sharp end of the culture, you know. But it's also just all the same thing. Yes. When, when you criticise this, you are also criticising David Cameron's affirmative action policies. You're also criticising the Labour Party's race hatred laws you were also criticizing all of these things mm. and you were saying well look it's either one rule or it's a double standard and we seem to be perpetually trapped in the double standard and why should that be accepted you know i'm okay with them having this as long as for example some playwright could come out and say right we're gonna we're gonna write uh, a play about alfred the great and his fight against the danes and we don't mm. want any danish people there mm. actually mm. Uh, because this was a part of the ethnic english struggle against oppression mm. which it is mm. it's totally true uh, and so that would be considered racist <laughs> that would be forbidden actually you stumbled on there something actually called i don't know very very uh, topical yeah. um king alfred's fight against the danes right there was a play done in the 18th century and they needed a song for this particular part of the play. It was like one of these kind of pageants. Yeah. And they composed Royal Britannia. Oh, is that where it's from? That's where it's from. I didn't know. And yet, and as we speak today, uh, there are now qualms about this being played yet again um, at the last night of the proms this year. This every the, year. Yes, this every year. But that's where it's from. And in fact, so it's actually nothing to do with like enslaving the world or anything like that. It was, it was purely to as a kind of a bit of a battle hymn. It's resistance to yeah. oppression. Yeah. It's resistance to slavery. I mean, you can tell by the lyrics themselves, Britons will never be slaves. That implies that the threat of looming enslavement is on the horizon. Mm. And actually we need to find the moral power to resist it. Also, it's, uh, sorry, it's says yeah. I'm warming to my subject here. It's, yeah. <laughs> it's also Brit Britannia rule the waves. I, it's a command. Yeah. It's not rules the waves as in we do. Yes. Yeah. It's an imperative. Yes. Yes. Um, so anyway, just to get back to this, um, this is the, the chat. Uh, the, the play is starring Kit Harrington, 
who is best known for his role as Jon Snow on Game of Thrones. Uh, so that's interesting. I assume he's going to be a slave master or something like that in it. He's a little bloke, isn't he? I've, I've no idea. He's tiny. Yeah. Is he that small? I think so, yeah. No, I didn't know. Um, but, uh, but yeah, Jeremy O'Harris said that he was so excited uh, for this um, because, as you say, he says, it's a necessity to radically invite them in with initiatives that say you're invited, specifically you. Uh, that's very interesting because legally you're not allowed to simply say the color of your skin. Of course not. not. No. Limit you entry. No. Um, but this has actually uh, happened before as well. As uh, and again, it was very hard to find any information about any of this because nobody really wanted to talk about it. This is a very progressive write-up of it. Um, but as they say, uh, last year um, in May, there was a similar fuss made out about a play called Tambo and Bones, mm. uh, the Theatre Royal Stratford East. Because they had a quote blackout performance, uh, and so this is something that's happened before, and they mm. knew it was going to happen, and they don't care. That's mm. the point. Mm. They've decided no, this is for our ethnic group, mm. and your opinion on that is irrelevant. The liberal norms on that are irrelevant. This is something we're going to do for ourselves. Like, okay. Mm. Well, again, it's an interesting precedent that you're setting, and you're kind of putting demands on people when you do that because that's not supposed to be the kind of society we're supposed to be living in. Exactly. And what this does is reveals that we don't live in the kind of society that we thought we were living in, actually. So, well, it gives the, gives the lie entirely to the, whole, to the whole kind of premise of multiculturalism, doesn't it? And, and diversity well, being yes. a strength. <laughs> but they certainly are insisting that integration isn't happening. Mm. Um, and what I find really weird about this as well is, do you really want to fetishize this as well? Like, Okay, so what, what are we doing? Well, we're making the entire identity of black people just purely about slavery. There's just nothing mm -hmm. about the black identity that isn't about slavery in the modern day. And it's not even a good story. It's, you know, if it was an emancipatory story, that would at least be something. Mm -hmm. But that's what the, you know, one of the reasons I, I hark to Alfred the Great. You know, it's an emancipatory, emancipatory story of the English getting out of Viking rule and Viking domination. So at least, okay, it sucked, but there's something positive that comes out of it. But you never hear about the emancipation narrative in these sorts of stories. It's always about the, the struggle of oppression and how that translates into the modern day. And it's like, you're free now. You are actually free. You could do with that what you want. And all you're doing now is focusing on the history of oppression. So. Well, we've seen this as well with this week with the Church of England, actually. Oh, yeah. Another one of our institutions, yeah. which in fact... You would think, wouldn't you, that they would highlight William Wilberforce and indeed the very strongly Christian yes. effort of the abolition of slavery uh, in the 19th century. But no, um, they've just uh, hired or going to hire a deconstructing whiteness officer in the West Midlands, yep. for example. And yesterday we heard that also they're going to try to up the fund with the anti, you know, the Basically reparations, because that's what they're talking about. Yeah, yeah, then. 100, 100 million up to a billion, mm. right, in order to try to expunge the, the, the moral sin of slavery. Mm. So for them, it's a kind of, this is a, a, an issue of what, 200 years ago, whatever, but somehow or other, it is the mm. guide to all of their policy at the moment. It's incredible how the Christians can't even take credit for the end of slavery either. Mm. Because if you go back and look at any of the uh, letters that have been signed, the petitions that were handed to Parliament, uh, it was all based on the Christian ethic that we were all equal in the, mm. in the sight of God. Mm. And it was, it was intrinsically Christian. Mm. And yes. they, I mean, Benjamin Franklin uh, wrote a letter about it. And he just begins with this is against God's image and against God's will for the world mm -hmm. and it's like if the church can't even claim that as a moral victory yes to say no we're the reason that slavery doesn't exist anymore actually so um you're welcome you know mm -hmm. if they can't even claim that then what hope do they have and so like when uh when it comes up well i mean the church is going to pay a billion for reparations my only answer is why isn't it two billion mm -hmm. hmm. why not three billion mm -hmm. is it structural racism that's holding you back i think it might be i think maybe five billion uh mm -hmm. ten billion mm -hmm. yeah, you, you need let bankrupt them Bankrupt them. If they're going to fall into this pit, let them go. That's what I say. I think actually, yes. I mean, as, as you say, there's a, a never-ending quality about it. 
and indeed with this play. Yep. I mean, basically, it's got to be nipped in the bud. You can say, actually, no, what you're proposing is illegal. Uh, so essentially, no, sorry, you're not going to be able to do it. Uh, otherwise, we are going to have this popping up more and more in the very nature of things. It won't actually necessarily be on a, along ethnic lines. It might well be a, uh, a men, or, well, no, men only. It might only be a, a women only play, for example, a women well, only this audience. Has happened. Uh, there really? Been, yeah, there have been movies in America where they had, uh, in New York in particular, I can't remember the name of the movie now, uh, but they had, I think it might have been the 2016 Ghostbusters movie. They had women only screenings. And a man went to go down to one. And of course, they have a similar law about, against discrimination there, mm, mm. Um, which was just flouted. Mm. Just, no, sorry. This is for the oppressed and not the oppressor. Of course, it grew to be a great classic, didn't it, that movie? It did. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm not certain it was. I think it might have been. But I've got, there are some interesting points in this, right? So um, the question then becomes, well, who is someone who's black? Yes. Like, Identifying who, as black is what they say. Well, they do. They this say, is for identifying as black. Yes. And so, uh, they, you know, this, this defense of this as well. I mean, some people have been silly about this, but the basic point is it's meant to be inclusive of mixed race audience members who identify as black. It's like, well, anyone could identify as black. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We're in a brave new era of people identifying as whatever they like, we're told. So why is this off the table? And the only thing that one has to conclude is it wouldn't be off the table. Legally, they couldn't stop you. Mm, mm. You could go in there and say, in an Ali G sort of fashion, mm. uh, I'm black, so let me in. And they are compelled to do so. Mm. Uh, I'm sure you'd be un uncomfortable. I'm sure you'd be unwelcome. But, um, but they do say that, you know, can non black audience members attend the Blackout Night? Uh, and uh, the inventor of Harris has said that it's fine if uh, black attendees bring along non black friends and their partners. Uh, nobody is going to block admission to anyone because, of course, legally, they wouldn't be allowed. Um, however, there are literally dozens of non-blackout performances, so why would you uh, go to a blackout night if nobody in your group was black unless you're being weird? So, right. That's very interesting. Yeah, yeah. Because there are lots of things that are, I mean, in other ways particular to other groups that we insist have to be inclusive. Mm. So it's not that you can't come, but why would you want to? And you could say that about almost anything. Yes, you could. Yeah. You might want to be a straight couple who want to go along to a gay pride march, for example. Yeah. Yeah. Many people say, why would you want to? <laughs> but, including me, actually. But I mean, <laughs> basically, but essentially, uh, it's, of course, absurd. And it's based on the premise that it's not going to be put to the test. Yes. Yeah. And also... I think what they're trying to do is remodel the way that they perceive society to be. So they perceive society to be a predominantly white construct in which black people have to adhere to the norms and social rules mm. of white society, as they will put it. Um, and what they're trying to do is say, well, no, look, one or two white people is fine because you're not going to change the nature of the fact that it will have a black gaze rather than a white gaze. And so... Again, that opens a whole Pandora's box. I say, okay, well, then we have to talk about ethnic composition, then, mm, right? Mm. And who has the right to have comfort in a space? Mm. And if it's not the majority, why is it the minority? And if it is the minority, then give me how that comes about. And if it is the majority, then why is it that public discourse in Britain is focused entirely on minoritarian concerns? Why is our parliament completely racked with debate over Israel and Palestine? when mm. most of Britain are not Muslim or Jewish. Why is that the case? Well, um, I would say it is what well, they've, they've, they've made it the case. I mean, exactly. simply, simply by, if you just look at the demonstrations over the past, uh, what is it now, three or four months? Mm -hmm. I mean, whatever, wherever you stand on this conflict, um, basically it is highlighted and brought to the surface certain sort of things that have meant meant that many people now feel extremely uncomfortable um, and their eyes have been opened actually to it. Um, and so essentially um, it has become a thing. It's certainly become a thing as well when we have parliament changing its procedures just simply because they are frightened, not necessarily of the crowd outside, but also of what's happening on people's doorsteps all around the country. And generally, and generally there, there is fear. Right. And not unjustified fear either. It's not, but I think it's actually almost more fear of the numbers involved. I think that's why 
basically the police essentially are facilitating all of this. Mm. Um, one of the reasons being is that they sort of kind of know, look, as one of them said in one of the clips that have been on social media, there's far more of them than there are of us, mm. right? He talking about the police. But essentially, it has forced the issue, this kind of intimidation mm. and domination and praying, collective praying in the street and all of these things. So it's actually kind of forced the issue. But I would agree with you that what's happened is that minorities, you know, without question, Trump now majority. And that has been the case for actually for quite a few years. It's, it, it's, I mean, you say without question, but like almost that seems like overstating the case. It's been such a retreat for the majoritarian position mm. that it's as if it no longer exists. Mm. It's as if there is the idea that the majority white British population of the country deserve, you know, the, 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 the straight white English, Scottish, uh, or Welsh heterosexual family deserving representation in their own politics is, a, is an archaic absurdity. Mm. So what do you mean? Why would you deserve representation? Why would you deserve to feel comfortable in your own country? Why would you deserve policy that facilitates that? You know, this, this whole thing has been so marginalized. It, it, it has. But you see, minorities generally, and I would say particularly ethnic minorities, but minorities generally have been made sacred. Yes. They've been made sacred. So essentially to criticize any position they might have on anything is actually to be profane and, and wicked. Yeah. Um, it's also, it's not actually to do with woke. Woke is just the latest expression of it. But so far back as I can remember, Carl, actually, I mean like decades, the idea that we should somehow feel shame as a country uh, has been there. For, you know, it's just simply got far more intense in recent years. Um, when you have people like that in charge of our institutions, people who are essentially ashamed or essentially self-hating, when you have those in charge of all of our institutions, from the civil service through to, indeed, the theatre, then basically they are automatically going to favour minorities. Yeah. Almost... With you know, without any discrimination, any minority will be better. You know, this is one of the main reasons why the situation we're in never seems to actually improve and only get worse. Because you know, we've basically been quite literally disarmed. You know, mm -hmm. our sense of ourselves, we've been disarmed, um, and that has been going on for a long time. Um, you well, know, you, I'm I'm reminded of Orwell, who must have been writing back in the twenties when he said, uh, "The average cosmopolitan liberal in." running the country would rather be seen stealing from the church poor box than singing the national anthem. That's right. He did indeed say that. Yes. He said, well, in fact, he went one further. He said that the, uh, the English intelligentsia mm. is unique in the world in that. Mm. He said unique in the world. It's quite true actually, because yeah. like the French intelligentsia aren't like that. They're positively kind of right wing head. <laughs> yeah, when it comes to being uh, yeah. French. But uh, no, he's quite right. And in, in fact, he was writing that in the late 1940s. Oh, um, absolutely right. You go back to 1920s, the Bloomsbury Group, all these people, very, very much the same. He said the uh, Englishmen are also unique, English intellectual, in hating all of English taste in things, whether it's cuisine, whether it's building, whether it's anything, any kind of English thing um, will be uh, looked down upon. The difference now is that, obviously, he was talking about what could genuinely be called an intelligentsia. Uh, what we've got now is a kind of lumpen intelligentsia, right? <laughs> oh, and they that's, basically, a, that's a generous term in and of itself. Huge, huge army, all being sort of basically spewed out by universities from the 60s onwards. Yeah, no, I think you're completely correct. And not to go off on a tangent, but I think it, it is to do with liberalism itself, mm. because the the fact that we have to describe these things as English gives them a parochial centered particular mm. aspect rather than being something that is abstract and universal to all mankind. Mm. And so it naturally excludes other people. And those things that are excluded are the minority concerns. And so mm. they become special to the liberal because hang on a second, why do they why isn't there equal representation and equal recognition? Mm. in this mm. and the the issue of course is well it's a culture of course mm. there's not equal recognition mm. there's recognition in different levels and the appropriate level of recognition for a minority group is much smaller than mm. the appropriate recognition for the majority group 
which is just the democratic principle. Mm. And so we're at a point where democracy means elevating a tiny minority to be the sole point of concern of the entire country. Now, in other times and places, that might be considered an aristocracy because that is also a description of what an aristocracy is. But we've arrived at the point where these two things have harmonized into the word democracy. And I mean, just to put a fine point on that, Rishi Sunak came out and said, hang on a second, is this actually right, chaps? And it's like, there we go. We've got the unelected um, <laughs> North Richmond MP uh, explaining that maybe this isn't good, but of course he's not going to do anything about it. He just says restricting audiences on the basis of race would be wrong and divisive. But then legislate. Do something. Mm. Thing is, you see, he talks about these things soon. I was also reminded of this when he made that masterful uh, uh, speech outside number yes. 10. He speaks about these things as though he's never, ever thought about them. Yes. He's never, he's never considered them a priority. Yes. So basically, you know, the whole feeling of him is that this is new ground to him. No, he doesn't feel sure. I mean, to sort of say what he's, what is it, Carl, he actually says? Uh, he something? said, restricting audiences on the basis of race would be wrong and divisive. He could say is wrong and yes, divisive. Yes, yes, yes. Exactly. And, and he'd also, he could follow that with, and we won't permit it. Yes, exactly. Because it's wrong. Exactly. As if, as if this is hypothetical. I mean, this, isn't, this has been done before, and they're going to do it again. And the conservatives sat there and go, well, if only there was someone who could do something about this. If only we had a moral principle to stand on here. Uh, I mean, you, they'll, they'll call themselves One Nation Conservatives and then do nothing. But as I said, I mean, like, you know, when you saw him making that speech last week outside number 10, I got, kind of got very angry at it, actually. I wasn't just dismissive. I got angry, you know, because, first of all, to talk about, you know, the Islamist and far-right threat, I thought, what are you, what are you talking about? You know, what are you talking about? You've been told to say that simply because... You don't want to alienate friends in the media and your friends around number 10 or whatever. Also, you don't want to be singling out a particular group, even yes. if there have been cases that point to an issue that resides within that group. You can't single them out because, again, the world order will not permit it. Hmm. And so you have to have no worry. It's extremism in the whole. So. Yeah, but my point, and then it was also echoed, wasn't it, by Cameron? Yep. He did the same, said the same thing. My problem with that. Is first of all, apart from the fact that this is simply a lie. I mean, it, you know, in the sense that when I was in the London Assembly f for five years, I c can't think of the amount of times where basically the right wing, the far right threat was being talked about. You know, you never kind of got to know what the kind of groups were or, or any of this. I'm not doubting that probably there are some people, but it's not the point. 19%. I, you know what, Peter, just to interrupt, I think that you're the far right threat that he's talking about. Well, well, and, and, and so myself, you're not. Okay. And Calvin Robinson and just normal patriotic people, I think. Yes, far right threat. possibly. I mean, uh, if that is the case, um, then... Um, you know, yes, I, I can I can see uh, the logic of what he means there. Mm. Um, but uh, when he was talking about the dangers of, he was talking about was he? He wasn't even talking about terrorism actually. Was he was talking yeah. about the dangers of extremism? Yeah. Yes, of course. Yes. What does that mean though? Because yes. I view the Conservatives as, a, as an extremist party themselves. If you appreciated that episode from the podcast of the Lotus Eaters, you can go to lotuseaters.com to get access to all the premium contents on the site, such as the Epoch series. This episode on Leonardo. If you'd like to find out what else is being put out, you can follow on Twitter at lotuseaters underscore com on Twitter. Thank you and goodbye.